Hello and welcome to the Next Steps podcast from Citywide Baptist Church. My name is Matt Henderson and I'm one of the elders of Citywide. And joining me are these three gentlemen here today. We've got Matt Garvin, the senior pastor of Citywide Baptist Church. We've got Paul Dare, one of our other pastors at Citywide. And we've got Mitch Simmons, one of our youth leaders. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Mike. Um, okay, uh, Matt Garvin, tell us why we're doing this. Good question. Uh, well, we've been really wrestling as a church. We're trying to work out, okay, how, how do you actually follow Jesus? And what does it mean to be open to the Bible? But also to do uh, face the fact that Sunday mornings have changed and the world's changed. So... There was a time where you're preaching on a Sunday morning would be enough. That would be enough people to think about. That'd be the main input they get through the week. These days, most people are engaging with all kinds of other voices through the week and Sunday morning isn't enough. Uh, they get, you know, we might get half an hour's teaching on a Sunday morning, but uh, most people apparently, uh, I heard from a Crindle research that about 70, that for people under 30, uh, 70% of their waking hours is connected online in some way. Uh, so uh, we, we not only need to uh, have other ways for engaging with uh, truth, but we also need uh, to address some of the really complicated questions that people face in a way that makes sense. And you just can't do that in 30 minutes. So if we're to get into, actually get into what the Bible means for us, we actually need to spend a bit more time and not just as, uh, you know, thus saith the Lord coming down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments kind of thing. We, we actually need to be able to kick it around, which is why it's good to have a few of us to ask questions and, and look at it from different angles and, and see if we can work out what does it mean to, to live this stuff in, in reality. You know, we, we, don't, we don't want to just play religious games. We want to work out what does it mean to actually live faith. So, it's, so this podcast is an attempt uh, to do that, to, to get into the Bible, to get in, to talk a bit more about what we're talking about on a Sunday morning, but to go a bit deeper and to get a bit more practical. So to, to really ask the question, so what? Uh, hopefully what we do on a Sunday morning opens a discussion that this, you know, helps us take next, helps us take some next steps with is the goal. Thanks, Matt. And yeah, it's worth noting that um, we're going to be having hopefully a revolving cast through this podcast. We're hoping that um we can get the different people who deliver our, our Sunday morning messages, uh, different members of our teaching team to come on and talk hmm. about what it is they uh, taught us about on Sunday morning. And yeah, like Matt said, to, to go a little deeper because um, yeah, at Citywide we've, we've been working on a, a way of doing our Sunday messages where there's uh, often two messages and they're shorter and it's hard to, say everything that needs to be said in, in that amount of time. Um, so yeah, this is, I should have said up front, this is kind of episode zero of our podcast and um, people are kind of joining us at the end of a series with, uh, for most of this year, been going through the book of First Corinthians. And this week we, we finally came to the end of First Corinthians. Um, so yeah, Matt, tell us, um, Tell us about what we talked about on Sunday. Yeah, I, I've, I've really loved 1 Corinthians just because it's the messy reality that most of us experience. Like many of us will have had religious experiences that are beautiful, but then we hit real life. And, uh, and particularly if you had anything to do with churches, uh, churches are messy because they're full of people who think differently and act differently and don't always agree with uh, the senior pastor, which, you know, I'm looking for ways to change, but it doesn't seem to work. Uh, but so I, I, I think Paul experienced that and he, write, he writes to the Corinthians who are in a very similar community to, to us here in Hobart. Hobart is uh, a wealthy middle class kind of city. It's not a big city. Uh, it is a city, though, that uh, prides itself on its inter intellectual horsepower. It, uh, it's a city where Christianity isn't the major religion anymore. Uh, and uh, it's a city where churches are, generally speaking, going backwards. Um, so 
we we were looking on sun at Sunday on the on the final chapter as Paul tries to bring it all together. And so far, what we've been doing at Citywide since COVID is rather than having one message, we've been having two, uh, two shorter ones, uh, and uh, dividing things up that way. And some often it'll be uh, two of us actually doing the teaching, so we'll split it up between us. But the last couple of weeks, it's been me doing both. We all had to put up with me, um, and uh, I, I've really enjoyed the journey. But in, in one Corinthians sixteen, Paul. Uh, the chapter kind of divides neatly. Uh, the first few verses are about money and about an offering for the uh, the poor in Jerusalem. And so we talked a bit about the, God's approach to money and and what does it mean. And and I, th- I I think as I was coming in to talk about it, there was a bit of a burden uh, because I realized I, I realized coming in, I don't think we talk about money enough. We did a sermon series about it uh, about four years ago, uh, but. Uh, Jesus said that one of the main reasons people who call themselves his followers will fall away uh, is the deceitfulness of wealth and the worries of this world. That uh, money uh, is a big reason why the church is ineffective because, as I said on Sunday, I think um, money represents your ability to make choices. Uh, And and most of us want to retain that ability and give God whatever is left over after that. Uh, but uh, the Bible is very clear. God talks a fair bit about money and it has to be more than uh, about the little bit that's left over. So Paul talks about this offering, but he also uh, earlier in the book talks about uh, supporting your local church and the people who serve in the local church. And he he references the practices the practice of tithing, which again is a controversial thing in the church. People don't like to talk about tithing. It feels like it's a, a legalistic thing and people in the Protestant church are very nervous about anything that looks legalistic. But sometimes we can do that to our, our own downfall, I think, because we get too hung up on it. Uh, Paul also talks about the importance that administration of money is transparent. Uh, but overall, the heart of what he's trying to say is that this question is, is Jesus Lord? Uh, and that money is one of the places that, so this is how he starts his letter. It's a theme right the way through. Uh, and he, he's basically saying when it comes to money, uh, does it reflect the fact that you are a follower of Jesus or not? And I think most of us, I don't know if anybody, I don't know, it's a, the four of us, but uh, I don't know if anybody watching this can say, yeah, no, I've got my stuff with money completely sorted out. I really believe I'm doing what God wants me to with my money. It's an ongoing process. And uh, Paul lays out uh, what does it mean to be responsible, to care for people uh, who are part of the church, but not directly in your vicinity. So he's talking about people in Jerusalem and there's this assumption that we in the church have a responsibility for people who are part of the church but not directly near us or related to us and so for us that would be people like the church in Afghanistan do we care about that right now do we care about the church in Africa that that's the sort of stuff so that was that's the first half of the message we talked about on Sunday uh I don't know if you want to kick yeah, around no, that I think or... I think we'll kick that around before we we get into the second half um Mitchell, if I if I if I could just ask you a question, as a, as a young Christian, how how does that discussion about uh, that biblical discussion about finances and money hit you? Yeah, um, it was a really interesting one, honestly, because obviously we're all young people; we don't really have a, a lot of money or the funds or anything like that. Except, I think there was a, a feeling among us that we did want to give, and we do want to do that. However, people like myself, who's you know, I'll work, I won't work for a month. So I'm, I'm not getting any money. However, then I'll work a lot after that. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out how do I actually give? And, you know, this is a sentiment among others as well. How do I give in a way that is still, you know, being generous and from my heart, but in a practical way, like, do I give a set amount, you know, per each time or mm. I think, yeah, we were just sort of having queries about that sort of thing on Sunday. That's a good question. So I'll tell you, some of us older people have the same question. <laughs> Did you come up with an answer at all as you kicked around? Um, I think we were just thinking about, you know, trying to 
I guess it came back to giving what we're willing to give and giving in a way that, you know, is showing our heart for God and stuff as well. So I guess nothing really came certain. However, I was thinking maybe I just try and give a set amount that I'm, you know, willing to do and stuff per time, I think. But the others, I think, were still quite unsure, unfortunately. Mm. And I, the way I used to do it and the way I do it is um, because my income was very flexible as in like same as you Mitch I used to go well this is how much I earn a year Mm. 10% of that is that so I'll give that each week that's the way I work it and I know people get upset about the 10% thing but um, I found that over time the 10% is the example set in the Old Testament so that's the one I I tend to sort of go to and I think Mm. that should be the sort of minimum that's in my own heart I think that should be minimum but Mm. I found that you really get to the point where if you, especially these days, it's a lot easier because you can electronically tithe it. And so you go, you never miss it in the end, but it's really hard to get to that point. I must admit that's one of the biggest battles I've, I faced as a Christian along my journey was getting to the point where, okay, God gets the first 10% and doing that. That is one of the biggest battles. And the other battle is also giving that 10% and not wanting, not trying to put conditions on it. Yeah. Which is the other hard thing, because I find that, um, you know, you can say, oh, I'll give 10%, but I wanted to go to this. That's not really giving because that's your heart's being hardened towards it. So you've got to, there's a real trust of the church leadership when you give too. I think that's the other thing. Mm. There's also a, a an obedience and, um, Ah, I don't know how to explain it. Like, I mean, we have a low income family and, and we initially were not tithing as much as we should have because we didn't feel like we could. And then at a certain point we made a decision, no, we're going to, we're going to tithe more and we're going to not worry about whether we can afford it. And funnily enough, you know, God worked it out for us. You know, the money we thought we'd miss, we didn't really miss. Mm. Mm. that's certainly my experience and I, I think that for me as I finished the, the message on Sunday that, that that bit from 2 Corinthians where it says God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times having all that you need you'll abound in every good work that there's this kind of promise that yeah. if you're faithful you actually will be it won't stop you in fact it'll somehow it's, it's not like this magic fairy kind of thing that where you deposit 10 bucks and you get a hundred bucks back. It's not like that, but somehow if you're faithful, uh, God recognizes it. And, it, and mm. it somehow you, it does seem like there's from, certainly from, there were two moments, two things I did in my life that seemed to open a pathway. Uh, one was getting baptized. And then all of a sudden I started to, after getting baptized, I started to, get frustrated about things differently and see things differently. And my life started to track somewhere. And the other one was, was actually getting organized to, I always used to feel guilty because I'd talk about tithing and stuff, but, it, but actually getting organized to do it. And somehow things actually started to change in our life a bit as we started to, to do that. And so it's not, it's not magical. And and I'm not, I'm the, I'm really not the world's best administrator. So we, we have, we do it like Paul saying through, um, working out okay roughly how much do we get a fortnight for us we do get a, a sort of a fortnightly income uh and uh i uh, it's more about half of that i send to the church uh, give to the church uh half of it goes but we, we split between two missionaries that we support um and uh it, it is interesting because i've heard a number of people that that I think the 10%, I agree with Paul, that the 10% thing is a good start and it's an important start. And I've heard a lot of people say, look, I tithe um, 50 bucks a week and it's clear that they're making a lot more than um, 500 bucks uh, a week. So tithing in Christian circles uh, became synonymous with just whatever you gave, uh, but it's clear that in the Bible it was never... It was never meant to be synonymous. Like it wasn't a. It was. It was always meant. It was always meant ten percent, and it was. It was never the full. It was never the. 
like what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 16 isn't actually, I don't think, the tithe. He's, he's talking about this additional collection on top of that. Well, I wanted to ask you about that, Matt, because you kind of mm. on Sunday drew a, a little bit of a distinction between that tithe and then what you called offerings. Um, and well, that, I've, I've never heard that talked about the way you did before. It was very interesting. So could you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, well, look, let's be honest. Uh, there's a limited amount written in the Bible and there's a whole lot of people with very comprehensive understandings of what that means. And that often mean, and for different people, that their comprehensive understandings disagree with each other. But what I see, what Paul is saying here, like in chapter nine, when we talked about it, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter nine, he says, he, he links the, uh, the giving to, um, where he says, don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple? This is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13 and 14. And that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered at the altar. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. So he's, he's connecting uh, the Levitical uh, challenge to say that you, as a, as a follower of Jesus and part of the church, there's actually a responsibility you have to support those who are called to the church. Uh, and that the way that happened in the Old Testament was through the tithe. Uh, Numbers 18 says, uh, to, to the Levites, I give the tithe as, as your inheritance. But the, the Old Testament also has this thing of offerings. And Paul here is talking about this, this gift, is, is the word he uses is charis, and it's a grace. Uh, and he's saying there is no, like where he's saying you have a, a job to do, you don't, it is a responsibility to give to the local church. It's not a, something you feel like doing. It's not something that, uh, this he's talking more as a, a grace and it's a, it's a reflection of God's grace for us. And, and so I, I would see it as a, uh, what he's saying as two separate commands to give. Uh, one to the local church and one to those beyond the local church. Uh, and that this is uh, uh, this giving beyond the local church isn't a, uh, like he actually says, everyone should give uh, as they have capacity. Uh, so it's, he's not setting okay, a percentage or anything like that, but he, he is saying that there is a responsibility to care for people beyond the local church. And I, I, I think, and this is what I, I find personally challenging. Um, because I, I'm, I think I'm, I'm at a stage where I can sort of rest on the laurels. Okay, okay I've got the ten percent covered, but I, I feel like what God's saying to me is, Matt, you know, it really that's just the start. And look around you, look at look at what's happening in Afghanistan right now. Look at you know Rehok or other ministries. Uh, look at look at your brothers and sisters around the world. It is just so easy in Hobart to get to think that this is the world <laughs> and mm. Hobart is so not the world. Like Hobart is so, uh, so comfortable. So it's so easy to get full of ourselves here. And I, I feel like part of one of the challenges for me from the message was that, that differentiating between tires and offerings. And I know there are some people who disagree with me about this, but I think it, what it seems clear to me that Paul's talking about two different categories of giving. Mm. So um, yeah, Paul, Paul Dare, like, did you did you want to have something to say about that? Yeah, I, it's, it's an interesting concept. Um, I just want to circle back to the other thing that Matt was saying before about um, giving and receiving. And I, I always found that once I started giving, like you know, the, at least the tithe, I never needed anything. I often wanted things, but I never needed anything. I think that's the mm. big difference. In, you know, it's not prosperity doctrine is like what Matt was saying. It's not, you know, put $10 in and get $100 back. It's, it's God's got you covered. If you trust God in your giving, God has you covered. I've yet to find anybody who has faithfully given ever go without what they need. They sometimes go without what they want, but not without what they need. And I think that's the most amazing thing about giving. It's just like, God does repay you. And it's just one of those mm. things. It's not, it's not instant, but it's when you need it, it is there. And that's mm. the big thing. And I think Matt was saying that the same too, you know, Matt, Matt mm. Anderson too. So that's it. And on the other one, um, on 
on offering versus tithing, I, I have a I have a view that's slightly different to Matt, but the outcome is the same in the fact that as a church we should give to help other Christians in need. You know, there's no doubt about it. There's yeah. no doubt about it at all. The question that actually arised and uh, is, and I'd be interested to see Mitch's take on this too, is what percentage, if we give to the church, how much of it goes into running the church versus how much of it goes into mission work or helping other Christians in the church? And is that a known figure? Is it a, a thing we worked out? So, for example, my concern would be, and I don't get me wrong, we need to help others, is if I gave, you know, $100 to the church and then I gave 200 the next week, would that mean that 100, 110 of that would then go to the other people or would just still only say, you know, 10% of it go to other Christians in need? Hmm. I don't know, Mitch. How, what, how how do you feel about about that kind of that kind of thing about uh, yeah, like uh, giving to the running of the church as opposed to giving more globally? Yeah, no. Look, it's actually a really interesting point, and to be honest, I I totally agree with what Matt is saying in that I think in, in Hobart we do get very comfortable in in this is the world, this is how it's run. Let's be all self interested and that sort of thing. Um, but yes, I've never even thought about, you know, obviously I've thought about the rest of the world, but it's just such a interesting way of thinking about things and how there are other Christians out there that are having, you know, so many troubles and that need our help and stuff like that. So, you know, the, the selfish Christian in me wants to go, right, everyone just give our money to us. So our church can be amazing and we can, you know, do great things. So ever, I think that's obviously quite selfish and I think we do need to help out all the other places and these missionaries that are doing great things and stuff as well. So in terms of how we divide that up, I honestly don't know. I guess that comes down to praying about that. And I guess trying to work out uh, with God as well, you know, what's the best thing to do. Mm. Mm. And look, that's why I agree with Paul, like what Paul is saying here, uh, the, the Paul, the apostle, as opposed to Paul there, uh, is uh, that, that the, that the money for this offering isn't just given as an individual, it's given to the church to then be dispersed. And, and that Paul talks about the administration of it. And it, I, you know, I think it's something we need to keep talking about. Like I have a sense, uh, I mean, I, I love the, I love the principle of tithing in that it's, it, what it means is, and uh Back in the uh, sort of the, the between the testaments kind of times, uh, after the destruction of the temple, there was the, the establishment of these synagogues, uh, and a synagogue would be established with uh, ten families or ten giving units. And because each, if each of them gave a tithe, then the the Levite or the priest who was looking after the synagogue would basically live on an average wage of the people he was caring for, uh, and so. Uh, when the people did well, the pastor did well. And when the people were doing badly, the pastor didn't go so well. Uh, I, I, I think there's this double-edged thing. Um, I, I would be surprised if everybody in our church or any church is actually tithing. Uh, and if that is true, um, I, I think the, then our people are living in a significant level of poverty. Uh, because we have, uh, I think we have um, about 300 people in our church all, all up. Uh, and uh, our annual income for the church uh, is 300 grand. Uh, so so each, of our, each of the people in the church is living on an income of an annual income of about $1,000 a year, which uh, I, I, I just don't think that's accurate um somehow challenge uh, thrown down <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but I, I think there is also this danger where we we're like mitch is saying we can have this poverty mentality we think oh, look we got I, I got there's so much stuff i want to do for our, I, I, that if we had a, a, a stronger team in our church i think it feels like we could serve home so much better and but there, there is this danger that we want to 
build the church and then give. I, I, I do think, like Paul's saying and Mitch is saying, we've got to keep lifting our eyes. And as a church, like I'm so grateful for the way we, we came together through COVID and we were able to give away $50,000 worth of food to uh, Nepali, the Nepalese community. 20 grand of that came directly from our church and 30 grand came from a partnership with the Billy Graham Association. Uh, and we do give, we, we sponsor a dozen, a dozen kids or so and we, we give we got to, in other ways. But I think probably both things need a bit of review. I, I think the, I, I think we need more income for the church to grow, for, uh, but we, we need to be given more, I think. Um, and, it's, and coming up to this kind of teaching is challenging because it, because it, it kind of, you kind of confront your, your own, your own approach, but also for us as a church, um, you know, what percentage of the income we have as a church should be given away? And what do we, what do we think about that? Should we have a principle of tithing the income from the church at least? Uh, and what do we count as giving giving it away? Like, it, it is money spent on outreach and support of the local community? Uh, is that giving it away, or is it only given away to other organisations? Um, so these are some of the questions that are flat around. Um, but it is, it is a little. It's a, it's a confronting question, particularly for someone as a, as trying to lead the church and think, how do we, how do we help us move forward? And, and what does it mean for us to, um, to grow? Uh, and, and, and also, and for me as a pastor, knowing that, so there's all that from the church's angle, but that fundamentally for each and every one of our people, their attitude to money, Jesus said, will be one of the things that holds them back from actually entering the kingdom. Uh, now you shared a really, a really, um, I mean, you've, you've shared it previously, but the, the Martin Luther quote in particular, that that's worth exploring a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, Martin Luther, the great reformer, said that there are three kinds of conversion. First is the conversion of the head. Second is conversion of the heart. And third is conversion of the wallet. Uh, and, and I, you know, it's, it's challenging that because I, I think it's your wallet where you make decisions and, and fundamentally, if your wallet doesn't reflect the values of the kingdom, you're not in the kingdom. You're not in a, the kingdom is the place where God's will is being done. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, uh, and I'll, I'll stop talking. I'm stop talking. I can go and rabbit well, on forever. I, again, like Mitchell, as a young person, that that mm. challenge right there, that from the Martin Luther quote, um, how does that land for you? Um, yeah, well, I'll give a young people perspective at least on Sunday as well, because we were we had that you know um, question in our discussion time, and I think we found ourselves going, what actually is the definition of the head, the heart, and I think the wallet's pretty self-explanatory, but what actually does that mean in particular? Like, can you give us a, a solid definition of what that means? From my perspective, there's, a, there's an intellectual, before, before God enters your heart, and for the, certainly from the Hebrew word for heart means your will. So before he enters your, how you make your choices and your whole life, and from a, from a Western perspective, your heart is your emotions, You've actually got to get to a point where there is a, a rational ascent where, where you in, in your head you go, yeah, okay, there's something to this. Um, and so for most people in the Western world, there is a, an intellectual response. Then there's a, a, a response that the Bible probably calls repentance, which is about your whole life. It's, and, and then there's the, the wallet, which is probably, that, that'd be my gut feel. I know, Paul, you kicked this stuff around before. Yeah, too, I, so. I, I, um, I sort of agree with the same thing. Like head knowledge is really this, you understand, you agree with the premises of, of God, you agree with all of that. But to be honest, your life doesn't reflect what you agree with. And it's when, it gets, when God gets into your heart or the Holy Spirit fills you, your actions actually agree with God. You know, like your actions are more God-like for want of a better term. You're, 
you suddenly understand and things that mattered didn't don't matter anymore and i think this is one of the things is it's really really hard to describe um but there's plenty of people out there who have a head knowledge of god but don't know jesus if that makes sense and as someone explained to me the other day it's a bit like i know god but i haven't got a personal relationship with jesus and that's how they describe the difference between head and heart Mm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there. Uh, I would tend to agree with that too. Like, there, there are actually a lot of people who um, have decided that there's a God, and and even believe in a God, but they don't like like Paul and Matt have sort of said they don't have a relationship with him. So, mm-hmm. like, yeah, that intellectual that 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 head thing is the yeah no I recognise there's a God, um, but I'm I'm perhaps not that interested. The, the heart thing is when it's like, no, I actually want to have a relationship with 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 God. And yeah, like you said, the, the wallet's fairly self-explanatory. <laughs> but it, it is a very challenging little quote there. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I thought we might move on to part two of your message, Matt. Part two of uh, chapter 16. Yeah, well, uh, I think... It was interesting. Part two was not uh, a cohesive theme. It was like Paul wrapping it all up. Uh, yeah. And so, and, and what I, there's some challenging stuff in it. Like, I, I love that the first bit from verse five to nine, he's just making it clear that it's about relationship. Uh, and he's looking for, he wants to hang out with people. And I think for me, just a reminder, because sometimes uh, in churches, we get focused on programs. And Paul lived with people. He would hang out with them and he'd do life with them. And he, and he actually says, I don't want to just drop in and give you some inspirational talk. I want to hang around with you for a few months. And I, I think that's a different approach to how we think about ministry, inviting people into your home and doing life. Then from verses 10 to 12, he addresses the fact that, uh, you know, uh, Timothy's going to come, but he's probably a young bloke and people aren't sure whether they'll trust him or not. And so he's saying, look after him. Don't cause him to fear. Then he also has to explain Apollos, who they want, and Paul wants to go and hang out in Corinth, but he's busy doing other stuff. And so one of the things that struck me was often in church leadership, that one of the major jobs you have is helping people see each other and give space for people who are different. Because, you know, we are. We, we genuinely are. And you can, and if, you, if we actually, we're talking about becoming an actual uh, moving to authentic community you can put it on if as long as it's only an hour and a half on a sunday morning everyone can be polite but if, if you're going to move beyond that it's going to get awkward and so a big part of uh the leadership of a church's job is to help people understand each other so i think that's what paul's doing there uh then he has this couple a couple of sentences that sum up the whole letter where he says be on your guard stand firm in the faith be courageous be strong do everything in love but he's just saying and, and Again, part of part of me would love Christianity to be this thing where you had this moment, and then all of a sudden everything's easy. He, he, he's making it clear, no, that's not it. It's you got, be on your guard. There's going to be things that want to come in and attack you from left and right, and take you off course. Stand firm in the faith. It's going to, there's going to be times that are, are, are going to want to knock you off your feet. It's going to take courage and it's going to take strength and all of those things are things that you have to actively choose uh, and then he's saying what he says more beautifully and eloquently in chapter 13 but he sort of sums it up and says do everything in love uh, and then there's this little throwaway thing where he he says um submit to people like stephanus uh he's, this this bloke he said has given up his life for the church and that you should submit to people like that. And it just struck me that none of us in the Western world want to submit to anybody. Uh, and so this is so countercultural. The church is meant to be a place where there are people who we see who have given up their lives for the church, and we should be willing to submit to them. And I look around our church, I, I see plenty of them. I see people like Jan, uh, who has clearly given up her life to serve the church. Uh, I see people like Agnes, uh, Pete Clark would sort of fall into that category for me. Uh, there's a bunch of people, and and it's really important 
to, and, and mostly, it's interesting that Paul feels the need to say you've got to submit to him. Most of those people aren't going to push their way. No. Most of those people aren't going to be, that, that you, he's not talking about the cult of celebrity uh, where there's the super pastor and everybody just bows at their feet and does what they say. No, he, he's talking that there are going to be quiet people who have given up their life for the church. And, and he says, submit to such people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to submit to such people and everyone who joins in that kind of work and labours in it. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I, was, I was personally challenged by that. And then uh, uh, he goes on and says, people that refresh your spirit, you need, they deserve recognition. And then he, he lands it uh, by saying, uh, if anyone doesn't love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Uh, come, Lord. Again, that's pretty full on. Like it's like, man, it, it'd be it'd be nice. And there's this. I, there's, I understand the impulse, particularly for the the want to love people, to to say it doesn't really matter what you think, it doesn't really matter who you follow. That's it. But Paul, make, you can't read the Bible and do that. Paul makes mm-hmm. it clear that, and, and 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 Jesus says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me." Uh, so. But then Paul finishes the letter by saying, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. And I just, uh, ever since I read um, What's So Amazing About Grace, I, 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 it was like this um, calming thing for me, this soothing thing. That I realised, I, I, and grace is something I, I, I realise I deeply need. I don't fully understand, but that, that, that God loves me <laughs> No matter, you know how badly I stuff up, and 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 it's not to do with me working stuff up or working stuff out. So, so that word grace is a is a beautiful word. I think that's how he finishes. So, as you can see, that last bit, I I was preparing myself. Thinking, I've got no idea how to talk about this because so, each one of these things you could spend an hour on, but Paul just spat them out, and I did my best just to spit them out similarly and try and finish the church service roughly on time. It's amazing um, so that you managed to get through that in 15 minutes on Sunday. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just really confronting and helpful stuff is the stuff I, yeah. I found anyway. So that I'll shut up at that point. So M- Mitchell, um, that stuff near the end there about submitting to, to people, uh, again, like from a, from a younger person's perspective, that, that's pretty heavy stuff. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, no, it seems like quite, I guess, an unusual concept in a way i think like well oh, why would i submit to someone that just seems a bit a bit heavy a bit, <laughs> uh, bit much but no i can i can really see its merit in that and that uh you know i guess honoring those people as well that have uh you know as you said those people that have almost you know given their lives to god and the church and to be uh you know amazing servants in that way and i think yeah it's just really important and um yeah, unusual concept, but I think it's really important to obviously honour them in that. Mm. Mm. And and certainly um, we can do, I know speaking from my own experience, you know, we, we can do most of our best learning when, when we actually do submit ourselves to someone in the church. Because it's actually very hard to learn from someone who you're not actually willing to, you know, sort of submit to. Like, why would you listen to them? <laughs> I, and I think this is where it comes back into the whole um, the love and multi-generational and grace all come into this because to to submit to somebody, you've got to have respect. And to have respect, you've got to get to know them. And to got, you've, you've got to get to know them. We all need grace. And for it to really work in a church, we need that multi-generational level of people submitting to other people. And it's not necessarily age age related either it can be some people are just brilliant at what they do and you know you can go and look you can go and sit at their feet and learn no matter what age they are and i think this is the thing but the challenge i've found it um for citywide for me at citywide personally is how do you get into the church how do you actually get into that community to actually get to this point like um you know, the Mitch and your you you tend to hang out with your lot. You know, Matt tends to hang out with his lot. You know, Matt hates not Matt's G. Um, 
Um, but, you know, we all tend to sort of hang out with those we feel comfortable with. And I think this is the challenge. And this is the whole grace thing, isn't it? The grace to see beyond not necessarily what you consider, uh, probably what you consider your normal friends to be, to, to be able to see the grace to see God in all the people in the church. Mm. And I think we need that authentic community, like Matt said at the start of the podcast. And But also we need, we need to be real that it is messy and it is untidy and it is confronting. And there will be some people that, we love them, but we really just don't click with them. And, th and that's okay as well, because that's part of being in a messy church. But it just comes back to, I think we just need to love each other. We need mm. to have that multi generational love. And I think then our community will grow because what happens is we end up living in silos if we don't do that multi generational thing. And I think that's where the church gets damaged. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think what you're saying is really interesting, Paul, because it leads back to, uh, what Matt was talking about that, that actually came, comes from the, the letter where um, talking about learning to see one another, learning for, say, for example, our, our, our young, I'm gesturing the wrong way, our young people to be able to see our older people. For, for citywide, we have the interesting challenge of having uh, a multicultural church because we have a, 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 a Nepalese congregation. And, and so there's all kinds of, um, areas in which we have different communities of people within our broader church community that all need to be able to see one another and understand and love one another. And, and these are people who might, who may be in a different kind of community wouldn't have anything to do with each other. Um, so Matt, from a church leadership standpoint, that that's an interesting challenge. It is. And I don't, see many churches that I look to and say, yeah, that's, I want to copy what they're doing. I, I, this is one of the front edges for us, I think. That's what I mean when we talk about becoming an authentic community. I feel like we're, we're naming something that we can see needs to be, but I, I just don't see a lot of people who are doing it well. I think the, the standard, like the silo thing, that is the standard model for doing church. You have your kids program, your youth program, your young adults program, your singles program, your young marriage program. You know, you have your men's breakfasts and your women's programs and you have your seniors program. Every, we have all these silos and we, we really don't know how to relate to each other well in authentic community. Mm. Um, and so it feels like we're putting the finger on a bit of the pain because we all kind of know we need it, uh, but we really don't know how to do it. And one of the one of the real challenges that keeps coming up for time and time again is most people are too busy for it anyway. Yeah. Uh, most people, th there's no way to have a relationship without spending time with people. And most of us are time poor. At yeah. least that's how we experience our lives. I mean, if you were to do a bit of an interrogation of that in terms of how much of the time is spent in front of TV or other things. It may be that there, there could be um, other things we could find or, you know, but, but most of it, most of us experience life as being time poor. And so there's an epidemic of loneliness uh, and anxiety, uh, but we don't know how to be community. I don't think so that I, I completely agree with what Paul's saying. I, I, I think how do we how do we help our young adults come into the heart of the church and our kids come into the heart of the church? But how, how do we help our seniors uh, come into the heart of the church too? And how do we help all of those groups come to terms with the fact that the others see the world differently? Um, so uh, that's... I know, Mitchell, we, we recently um, did a church survey and... and some of the feedback we got was that some of our younger people actually were really looking for this kind of stuff. Mm. I don't know if you wanted to share about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've been, I, even for the last two years, I think with our young adults sort of uh, group, I think, uh, yeah, I think oh, it was quite a while ago, but we actually did a listening prayer session with Matt and some of the young adults. And um, I forgot what the question was, but basically we all reached the same vision the same thing and that was intergenerational just connection and helping each other out and being there for one another and I think 
since then we've noticed that the young people we really want that connection we want to catch up with the the older people the middle-aged people whatever you know we want to learn things we want to know things that we don't already know and i think there's that yearning there for you know just that connection and you know i myself i'd love to go through church and go you know hey bob hey glennis you know whatever yeah. just go through and know everyone i want you know that sort of rock star feeling you know you're going past and going hey hey going blah 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 it's quite a yeah it, you know it's not a great example but you know i just i love that sort of feeling of knowing everyone and that um yeah and, and i guess the ways of doing that I, I don't know i mean there was the forced method i guess which is you know which um we did after church that one time or i think with in church i think we uh matched up with different people from the church and we just had like a single single sort of you know speed dating kind of thing and that was amazing i think all the young people from our group had a amazing chats with everyone and that was awesome but in terms of having a natural way of getting to know people and that sort of thing i'm, I'm not so sure but mm. Mm. there is something beautiful though isn't there about a church community where um I know speaking from my own experience, you know, you, 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 when you, when you get, when everyone gets together, which usually is only on a Sunday, it, it's, it's wonderful to think like even people who you're not necessarily particularly close to, you share something with those people. And there is a closeness, even though you don't know them that well, if that makes sense, it makes you more likely to want to get to know people because you have this, this wonderful truth in common with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So Matt, uh, as we alluded to at the beginning of the, uh, discussion, we've, we've hit, we've, we've come in at the end of a series and we're about to start something new. Um, mm -hmm. do you want to tell us a, bit, a little bit about that? Yeah. I've been really wrestling with, uh, what we do next. Uh, the plan was, uh, to dive headlong into the most controversial issues we could think of. Uh, and still planning to do that, uh, but I feel like it's right to just take the next six weeks to talk about what does it actually look like to grow as a Christian? Like, what does it actually look like to grow as a person? Uh, and what is it when Jesus says, "Go and make disciples"? What's what's a disciple? Uh, what does it mean? Uh, so, feels like in some ways we come back to basics in some ways um but i actually i think it's the kind of basic that none of us has completely covered because i i think i think we prioritize ideas uh but the the personal growth um that is required to build the kind of community mitch is talking about uh like one of the one of the things that all pastors have to cope with uh is that uh different ages and different stages see the world differently uh, and, and in order to, uh, for us to be a healthy community, we've got to learn to see our own stuff and, and, dis and distinguish between what is my stuff and what is truth and, you know, what is, who is Jesus and, and, and am I becoming more like him or less like him? That, that's the kind of stuff. So we're going to introduce our, disciple, our, our discipleship model. Uh, which you know, I don't know. I don't even know. It's a helpful way of talking about it. A discipleship model. It's very, but it, but it's what what it is. It's you know, it's not going to be rocket science. But this question of what does it mean to grow as a Christian is kind of what we're going to be looking at over the next six weeks, uh, starting next Sunday. I, I have one question, and this is probably more yeah. aimed at Mitch than anybody else. Um, I agree that we need to do the discipleship thing. Yeah, I don't like discipleship as a word either, but I understand what it means. Um, but the question is, Mitch, for mm. you particularly, because you're the only one not of the same generation as us three, really, is... Hey, hey, hang on. I'm a bit younger. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving on. Um, <laughs> um, we can do discipleship again, and, and it's great to do it. But how, we, how can we do it? to actually make it effective in maybe getting some of those multi-generational bonds happening, intergenerational mm. bonds happening? How, what, what, from your point of view, would help that to, to work? Yeah, that's a great question, honestly. And um, I think just 
Well, I can give you an example of when it has worked. And that was just when um, we had, you know, the awesome David Maureen, they came to our young adults group and um, we just basically just asked them a load of questions and they answered, you know, with humility and um, uh, gave a great amount of knowledge to us. And that was amazing. And both Mm -hmm. us young people and them that came away feeling amazing from that and we love that and even at church the next couple of weeks before they left unfortunately um they would come up to us and go hey how you going mitch blah 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 blah. and i did the same to them because we then created that bond and stuff and so i don't know if it's just even at church you know after having a cuppa that can be quite hard because i guess we are still in our silos as you were saying but i guess taking a step to then go and try and talk to people or try and work things out or even if we're just uh I think helping out is a great way of doing things as well. So like in the worship team, I'm with, you know, people of middle age, a bit younger, a bit older, that sort of thing as well. And I think doing things alongside each other and serving as well is also a great way of getting to know each other. And then I guess from there, uh, getting into those deeper conversations and things that can be pretty beneficial for both of you. But yeah, apart from that, I'm, I'm unsure. It's certainly the kind of question we've got to keep wrestling with, isn't it? Like we've got to keep working on. I think that was an interesting one, though. Um, actually, think the fact you're helping with people of different ages or doing a mission, a ministry with people of different by default gets you that as well, mm. which is which is a really interesting concept. So yeah, no, it's good. Thanks for joining us for episode zero of the Next Steps podcast. This this podcast will hopefully be being uplo- uploaded every Wednesday. Uh, we really appreciate any uh, comments, feedback, reviews, um, or questions. We really want your questions. So um, please send those to us as well. And um, yeah, to Mitch, Paul, and Matt, thanks for the uh, great chat. And we'll see everybody next week.